Thank you so much for joining us today. We'd love to hear your testimony about how God is using Destiny in your life. You can visit our website at destinychurchjacksonville.com and click on the testimony link. Also, if you'd like to partner with us financially, you can also do so online. Now, get ready to receive an amazing word from the Lord. Hallelujah. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, worship team. You guys are amazing. Can you let our sound, media, and worship team know how much you love and appreciate them? God is so good. Can you guys believe that it is the last day of June? Isn't that crazy? I, mean, I don't know if it's me, but I feel like the older I get, the more time flies by. Come on, can anyone else relate to that? I mean, it's crazy. It's crazy. And, and I think if there's anything that I've learned over the last year of my life, particularly, it's that life is short. And because it's short, we need to take advantage of every second that we have and not waste it. Amen? I'm talking about us being intentional in how we live our life and spending it on the things that matter. It didn't dawn on me until yesterday as, as I was thinking about today being the last day of, of June that it was exactly a year ago today that Jody and I, Buck and Carrie, were on our our way home from dinner, and I got a phone call from my dad uh, telling me that he had taken my mom to the hospital, and um, a couple hours later, she died. And I share that this morning because that tragedy, it, it woke me up to the reality of how short life is. Like my mom woke up a year ago today on a Sunday morning, and she went to church, and she went out to eat with some friends. She even had a friend over for uh, that later that afternoon, but she didn't realize that that would be her last day on the earth. And I hope that I'm not coming on too strong too quick, but I just have this heightened sense and awareness of, that it's time for us to become the people that God has called us to be. Because you see, it's so easy for us to live life by default rather than living it on purpose. But it's my, my heart, it's my prayer, my desire that today that some of you would flip that switch and that you would begin to live intentionally, live purposefully. And so can we just make that our opening prayer this morning? Come on, join me in prayer. Father, would you open our eyes to see things as you would have us see them? God, would you open up our hearts and just cause it to be stirred by the things that, that stir you? And God, would you move in such a way as to remove the things that have served as distraction in our lives? Jesus, we submit our lives to your lordship. It's your name. It's your renown that is the desire of our hearts. Precious Holy Spirit, have your way here in this place and in our hearts and let your word go forth in power and transform us into the people that you've destined for us to be. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever. And God's church says, amen. amen. Well, I would like for you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Micah. Now, Micah is a small book of the Bible. If you need a little bit of help locating it, just turn all the way to the end of the Old Testament and flip back seven books and you'll find the book of Micah. But as you're turning there, let me just say to those who have not been here for the past couple of weeks, we, we've been on a series called This Is That, which really has been a series on rediscovering the Holy Spirit. And if there's any one prayer that I have for this series is that, that we would begin to know the person of the Holy Spirit, and to hear his voice, to walk in his power, and to be obedient to his leading. Now, for the first two messages of the series, we talked about the who and the what. But this morning, I want us to talk about the how. 
And by how, I mean how to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And when I say sensitive, here's what I mean, because if you go to Webster's, you're going to find that there's many different definitions for the word uh, sensitive. But let me just share with you two that aligns with what we're talking about today. And the first one is to be receptive to sense impressions. And I love this definition here of sensitive because that is exactly how the Holy Spirit speaks to our lives, by giving us impressions. But we have to position ourselves in such a way as to be able to receive those impressions, which is exactly what we're going to talk about today. But another definition that caught my eye was this, to be highly responsive and delicately aware. Come on, what a a beautiful description of how we should approach the things of the Spirit, to be delicately aware and to be highly responsive. All right, now I want us to look at how uh, that connects with our text that we're going to be looking at today. So you should be in the book of Micah by now. Uh, Look with me over to chapter 8. In verse 8, I'm sorry, chapter 6, verse 8. The scripture says, he has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Now, in this verse, we read about three particular things that the scripture says that the Lord requires of us. Three things that I believe that if we will do will cause us to have a greater sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. And what are those things? To do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly. And so today I want us to just break down those three parts and look at how they apply to our lives and see how they can create and cultivate a greater sensitivity in our lives to the Spirit of God. And so if you're taking notes, I want you to write down this first point, and that's to live right. Come on, how many of you know that there is a right way to live, a way that God has called us to live. You see, when we read the words do justice, that means that we're to carry it out in our conduct and in our behavior. Actually, one of the translations of that Hebrew word there, justice, is the word right. So when the scripture says do justice, it's saying do what's right or live right. And I think this is a great starting point as we're talking about being sensitive to the Holy Spirit because we now live in a culture that believes that whatever is right to you is what is right. But how many of you know that's not right? Not a new mindset, though. I mean, really, that, that's the same mindset that's been around uh, for a long time. Matter of fact, we see that same thing in Judges 17, 6, whenever it says that everyone did what was right in their own eyes, and that was written 2,500 years ago. So nothing new here. But church, there is a right way that God has called us to live. And when we live the way that God has called us to live, it creates a greater sensitivity to the Spirit of God. I'm talking about us being obedient to God's word and his commands and also being obedient to the promptings of his Holy Spirit. And you know, I thought about this as I was preparing this point. As you read the different stories in the Bible, and for those who were obedient to God, they prospered. I mean, they prospered in every respect. They they prospered spiritually, they prospered physically, and they prospered emotionally. But do you know that God's word gives us that truth? He tells us that if if we'll just believe it. I mean, listen what Joshua 1.8 says. This is one of my, my favorite scriptures. It says, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. What's that mean? That means that the word of God is always to be on our tongue, right? This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that, now it's given the purpose for us meditating on God's word, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. I know there's not a person in this room that wouldn't say, man, hey, I I want my life to count. I want it to be successful. I want it to be prosperous. God's word tells us right here what to do. 
to meditate on God's word, to get it in our heart, and then obey it, right? It's not just enough that we have it up here, but then we carry it out in our action. It says, then we'll make our way prosperous and have good success. You see, I've found that when I'm obedient to God and I do what he tells me to do, there's a blessing that's on my life. And it's not one that I have to go looking for either. As a matter of fact, it hunts me down. And that's what Joshua 1 8 is saying right here that if we'll do what God has told us to do, that He will cause our lives to prosper. That He will give us a peace that we couldn't get in any other way. That He would bestow upon us a strength that we couldn't get from any other source. And that He would give us a joy that would come regardless of our circumstances. And understand that I'm not saying that we're just to be obedient to God just so that we can gain his favor, okay? That's what's called legalism. But I'm talking about allowing our love for him to be shown in our obedience to his word and to the leading of his Holy Spirit. See, I believe that there's a a level of obedience that that shows our level of love. As a matter of fact, um, let me share with you why I believe that. It's something that Jesus said in John 14, 23, and 24. He says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Now, these are the words of Jesus. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and he will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. See, true love for God will always lead to obedience to God. And can I just say that if you're having a problem obeying God, the fix is to spend more time with him. Because the more time you spend with him, the more you will love him. And the more you love him, the more that you won't want to grieve him. But let me also just share with you what I have found as a pattern in my life. And that's that every time that I lose my peace or my joy, it always comes on the heels of disobeying God. And every time that I disobey God, it always comes on the heels of not spending time with him. Church, I know that I've said this to you in various ways over the years, but God's commands for our lives is for our good. I want you to catch that. I want you to catch that. Listen to what the scripture says in, in Deuteronomy Chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. It says, and now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord, which I am commanding you today, watch this, for your good. See, God is saying here, everything that I've told you, this is for your good. Come on, how many of you parents have said that to your children before, like, hey, I know you don't understand what I'm doing right now or why I'm not letting you do this, but it's for your good. And that's because we know a few things that they don't know, right, parents? Well, guess what? God knows some things that we don't know. And if God is telling us that we should or that we shouldn't do something, then it's for our good. God is not holding back on us. If there's something that God's told you to do, if there's something that God's told you not to do, you can take it to the bank that it is for your good. Now, by the way, let me throw this in here because I think that sometimes that we think that, well, I've got to be able to understand it before I obey. No. Are you you going to let your kids kind of flow that way? Is that how they're going to roll? Well, sorry, Mom, Dad. When I understand it, then I'll obey. You get your butt in there and do what I tell you. You know what I'm saying? Why, why do we think we can pull that off on our Heavenly Father? Oh, I'm sorry, God. You, you're going to have, no, no, no. You see, if you want the peace of God that surpasses understanding, you're going to have to give up your right to understanding. Somebody needed to hear that. That wasn't in my notes. I'm just saying. But listen to what Psalm 84, 11 says. For the Lord God is a sun and shield, and the Lord bestows favor and honor. Watch this. No good thing does he withhold. From who? Those who walk uprightly. No good thing. You see, if we will live right, God promises to not withhold any good thing. And watch this. If we will do what God has told us to do, we'll have a greater sensitivity to the Holy Spirit in our lives. I want us to look back at our main text, Micah 6.8. 
First thing the scripture says that God requires of us is, is to do justice or, or to live right. But the second part is to love kindness. Maybe some of your translation says to love mercy, but for your notes this morning, I want you to write it down this, this way. Uh, be compassionate. Because if we want to have a greater sensitivity to the Holy Spirit, we must be compassionate. Church, we're called to be compassionate people, just like Jesus was compassionate. And what do we mean when we say compassion? Well, compassion is defined as this. It's the sympathetic consciousness of others' distress together with the desire to alleviate it. See, this is where compassion is different than just being sympathetic, right? Because sympathetic sees someone says, aw. But compassion comes along and it sees it. So it does involve sympathy, but then it does something about it. See, I feel like I can't even give that definition of the word without even thinking about Jesus. Because that is what Jesus' life entailed. Jesus not only identified the hurts and the needs of the people, but he did something about it. And each time that he did something about it, the writers of the Gospels always noted that he was moved with compassion. As a matter of fact, Matthew 14, 14 says, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Matthew 20, 34 says, Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. Immediately they received their sight and followed him. Mark 1, 40 and 41 said, a man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. He says, I am willing. He said, be clean. How, how many of you guys are grateful that Jesus is willing and he is still willing today, amen? amen? Time and time again, we see Jesus showing us what it means to be compassionate and that it isn't just being sympathetic, but it's us doing something about the need that we observe. Now, you may wonder, well, what's that got to do with being sensitive to the Holy Spirit? Well, when you start living the way that Jesus lived, there is a stirring of the Spirit of God that will happen on the inside of you. Come on, that's why when people go on a mission trip, they come back and have a greater passion for God. It's not because they like going out working in the hot sun and eating food that's going to give them diarrhea, right? <laughs> Who loves that? But it's because they're doing the things that Jesus did while he was here on the earth, putting others first and meeting their needs. See, we think that we just need to go to another conference to bring us closer to God. And nothing wrong with conferences, they have their place, but I'd like to suggest that what we really need to do is to get out there and do what Jesus did while he was here on the earth, hello? Right. 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 Reading another book or hearing another sermon isn't what's going to put fire in your spirit. I mean, it might serve as a spark, but it's not the fuel. You're hearing me this morning, church. This is a call for us to begin to live as Jesus lived. How did Jesus live? Matthew 9, 35 through 38. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers to his harvest field. Hmm. Friends, listen, your neighbors need your prayers, but sometimes they need your back. Do you hear me? Your coworkers and your friends, they need your invitation to church, but sometimes they just need a listening ear. Sometimes they just need someone to invite them to lunch to just to listen to them. You see, when we look at the life of Jesus, you'll notice that there's a simple two-step approach that he would always take and establish in his kingdom. It was demonstration, then proclamation. You see, Jesus would always demonstrate his love for them. He would go, he would feed them, he would heal them, and then he would proclaim to them the good news of the gospel. But you see, here's what I believe that we've done here as, as American Christians. We've skipped the demonstration. We expect people to believe the message when we failed to show them the message. I guess what I'm saying is this, is that if you want to have a greater 
sensitivity to the Holy Spirit, then look at how you can serve someone else. Look at putting someone else's needs above your own. And we talked a little bit about this, didn't we, just a few weeks ago when we, we talked about serving. And we even had a couple of guest speakers come in here that highlighted this. And God brought it to my heart again as I'm doing prepping. But just for those of you that are like, it becomes an abstract concept, like serving can be done in so many ways. I could sit up here for the rest of this message and give you ways that you can serve. I mean, it's so many different ways. You can, just spending quality time with someone can be a form of serving. Just helping someone out, maybe helping someone move, maybe, you know, helping someone in an area that you're good at and they're not good at. I don't know, you know, just all, but being there for them, maybe being a good listener, that, that's a great thing. Maybe writing someone an encouraging note. Uh, how about this, giving up your seat for someone uh, or just simply smiling. Come on, I mean, I, we, y'all, let's be honest. Like, I, I'm telling you, there's been days that just been, we all, have, we all have crappy days, man. And there's been days, there was a day not too long ago. I think I shared this in my last message. Forgive me if I did, but, but it really touched my heart that I just had a crappy day, you know. And, and, um, and someone smiled at me that morning. And, man, it changed my whole day. I really did. It changed the trajectory of my whole day. That was a service to me. The person didn't have to smile, right? And so that's a simple way, but. What we're talking about here, church, is we're talking about taking eye off of self and putting on the needs of others first. And when we do that, we're cultivating, we're creating a greater sensitivity to the Spirit of God in our lives. But I want to quickly get to the third point because I'm going to spend a little bit of extra time on this one. First point is to live right. Second point is to be compassionate. But the third point is to be humble. Now, I'm going to be bold and say that if you think to yourself, well, this isn't a point that I really don't need to hear, then this is the point, the exact point that you need to hear. <laughs> because at the moment that you think that you have arrived at humility, you've lost it. So I want to share with you just a few thoughts on humility. And let me just say that I'm sharing this from the place of the person that I want to be, not as someone who has arrived, okay? Okay. I know I still have a long ways to go. Those of you that know me well know that's true. (laughs) But, hey, we're all a work in progress. Amen? As Martin Luther once said, we're all mere beggars showing other beggars where to find bread. Let me start by saying what I know to be true. And that is that humility is cultivated in the presence of God. Because when we're in God's presence, it's at that place that heart transformation takes place. And humility is always a heart condition. As a matter of fact, Webster's defines humility as the quality or the state of not thinking you are better than other people. And so let me just go ahead and nip the bud and just say this, that you are not better than the person in front of you beside you or behind you. You are not better because of your race, your gender, your education, how much money you make, what title you hold. And if you think that you are, it's only in the theater of your mind, and I promise you no one's buying tickets to that show. Are you hearing me? Galatians 3.28 says this, and if we could just get this word right here in our spirit, it's going to change the way that we all interact with one another. For there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. See, watch this, man. To think higher of yourself is to think lower of someone else. And to think lower of someone else is grieving to the Holy Spirit of God who made that person and loves that person. You want to talk about what will kill your sensitivity to the Holy Spirit quicker than anything? Start thinking of yourself more highly and lower of other people. And that's exactly what will happen. But I want to be sure that you understand what I mean when I say be humble. Because humility isn't thinking less of yourself. It's simply thinking of yourself less. That's worth writing down. 
You see, rather than put others first, God wants us to put others first. And I'm going to leave you with a few more thoughts about humility. Proverbs 21 in verse 2 says that every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart. In other words, most of the time, we think that we're right, don't we? I mean, I know that I do it. I like to think that what I'm doing is right, but the Bible says that the Lord weighs the heart. See, in other words, what we think about a situation and what we hold true in our mind, it can really be more of a reflection of our, our heart. And so that's why we've got to listen to King Solomon's words in Proverbs 4.23 when he said to guard your heart for everything that we do, all of life flows forth from it. But watch this. You can't talk about humility without also talking about another word, teachability. You see, it's hard to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit when you're not teachable. Because many times the Holy Spirit will use a circumstance, a situation, or even another person to teach us something. And it's hard for us to learn when we think we know everything that there is to know. Now, no one would ever come out and just say that, right? I mean, no one's like, man, I think I know it all. But watch this. The moment that you look at a circumstance or a situation or a person and say, I can't learn anything from that or from them, then you're not operating in humility but in pride. And I want you to see from God's word why these two, wor uh, two words, these two things are so significant, humility and pride. In 1 Peter 5.5, 5, it says, all of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. There's a couple things that I want you to see here from the scripture. First is that none of us are exempt from humility. Notice that the scripture says that all of you. You see, this wasn't just true to the people that Peter were writing to a couple thousand years ago, but it is just as true for us today because none of us have arrived. And I love the word that Peter uses there in describing humility to clothe because it accurately describes what humility should look like in our lives. You see, this morning, each one of you chose to put on clothes, and thank God you did. But the clothes that you chose to put on were your choice, right? Anybody put on something and take it off and put on something else today? Yeah? All right, only the women raise their hand. The men's like, I'm not going to dare raise my hand and say that. But you know you did, right? But it was your choice. You looked at it. I looked at a couple and said, I'm not so sure that's going to fit, right? <laughs> Honesty moment. <laughs> but it was our choice. And guys, it's the same way when we're talking about humility. When the scripture says to clothe ourselves, it's saying we are given the ability to choose. You can clothe yourself with pride. It's your choice. Or you can clothe yourself with humility. See, here's the interesting thing, is that humility actually is not one of the fruits of the Spirit. It's a choice. It's a choice that we have to make every day. Each and every day, just like you have to choose to clothe yourself, you have to choose humility. Scripture goes on to say that if we choose humility, what will happen? It also says what will happen when we don't choose humility. It says that if we choose humility, that there's favor that comes our way. But listen to what it says when we don't choose humility. And by the way, when we don't choose humility by default, I mean, that's what's called pride. And the scripture says that God opposes the proud. Now, that word is a little bit stronger. Actually, it's a lot stronger than the uh, English translation that, that we use right there because it's actually the Greek word uh, antitasso. I, I studied this word in Bible college. It, it means to make war against. Now, stop and think about that just for a moment. When we operate in pride, we find ourselves making war against God or rather asking God, inviting God to make war against us. Now, if you think that that's pretty extreme, when you think about it, it actually makes sense. Because if you think, that is the very thing that caused Lucifer to be cast out of heaven. It's pride. Pride is a serious offense to God. But when we choose humility, we find ourselves walking in his favor. Now look, it doesn't take rocket science to figure 
or which side of the bench you want to be on there, right? But there's another point about being teachable that I want to highlight because being teachable, it isn't just a mind thing, but it is a heart thing. See, it's not just the people who are highly educated that can't be taught anything. As a matter of fact, can I just tell you that some of the most educated people that I know are very humble people. But you know what? I also know some people that are not that educated, and man, you can't teach them anything. They're very unteachable. Why? Because it's a heart issue. Being teachable is a heart issue, not a mind issue. So the scripture tells us what we should do, though, in order to be able to prevent this from happening in our lives. It's found in Ephesians 5, 21, and it says that we should submit ourselves one to another in the fear of God. Now, by the way, can I just say that this is not a suggestion from God's word, but rather it's a command? And so having said that, I just got to ask, who are you currently submitted to? See, church, I think that we believe that reading books and, and listening to podcasts is what it means to be teachable. We think of preaching seminars and things like that. And certainly, we, we can learn from those things. But I believe that the greatest lessons that God wants to teach us is through the people in our life. Sometimes, it'll come from our kids, right? It'll come from our spouse, our our community groups, our, our church, our circumstances, our coworkers, maybe even our employees and our neighbors. And I'm a firm believer that God is always using someone somewhere in our life to speak truth. But the question is, are we listening? Are we listening to what God is trying to say to us through those around us? Or are we rejecting it because we think that we know better? Now, if you're here and you say, well, I haven't had anyone say anything, you know, corrective to me in a long time. Well, can I just say that you're good, but you're not that good? I mean, if no one has said anything corrective to you, because we, we all need counsel. Hear me. I mean, you haven't arrived. Neither have I. And if there's no one who's ever speaking anything to your life, and I love you enough to say this, the chances are is that either A, you're not hearing them. Like they're trying to say it to you, but you're thinking it must be for someone else right? Like people often do in church, they hear a point, they're like, hmm, they think, I know somebody needs to hear that one. They're actually the person that needs to hear it. Ouch, right? So they're probably hearing it, and, or they, but, but they're not listening, or you've shut down those people that's tried to speak into your lives, and so guess what? They've stopped trying. Now, I can promise you that that's more people than you realize in your life that's come to you and love, try to say something, and you've shut it down, so they're just like, you know what? I ain't going there again, Reminds me of a story I heard many years ago about a pro golfer. His name is Tommy Bolt. He died, I think, back in 2008. But uh, Tommy Bolt was, uh, um, he was inducted into the World Golf Hall of Fame. He was, um, I think he won 15 PGA major titles. He, he kind of golfed through the 40s, through the 70s. Uh, but he was kind of infamous for throwing and, and, and breaking clubs. That guy, and, and having a real hot temper on, on the golf course. Well, during one match, Bolt was frustrated. And he said to his caddy, he said, don't say a single word to me. He said, you only answer and reply with a yes or a no if I ask you a question. And so during the round, Bolt found a ball next to a tree. He sat down and he sized it up. He had to go under a branch and over a lake in order to get onto the green. And he looks at his caddy, he says, what do you think, a five iron? The caddy says, no, Mr. Bolt. He says, what do you mean, no? And he goes over and he pulls the five iron out of himself. And he says, no, Mr. Bolt. He says, watch this. And he goes and he hits the shot, hits a perfect shot. Goes up, puts it two feet from the green. He looks over at the caddy, says, huh, what'd you think about that? Puts it back in the bag, he goes, you can talk now. And his caddy looked at him and says, no, Mr. Bolt, that wasn't your ball. See, sometimes the things that we refuse to hear are the very things that we need to hear. Let me just bring balance to that by also saying, though, that I know that not all uh, correction and 
or that all that being teachable doesn't mean that we're obligated to take every piece of advice that someone gives us because not all criticism is equal in value. But here's what I want to do, and I just want to get practical for a moment. I, I hope this helps you guys. Uh, I, I want to share with you um, three guidelines, if you will, uh, which I think all fall under humility for whenever someone speaks a word of correction or advice. And, and the first one is this, is, is to listen without being defensive. You know, it's so easy for us to want to immediately be defensive whenever someone brings us a word of criticism. I, I used to think that every time someone would share advice with me, that somehow they were uh, trying to attack me. But you know what I found now that I look back is actually in most all cases, I was wrong. That's where Proverbs 27, 6 comes in when it says, faithful are the wounds of a friend but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. The second thing that we do is then pray about the criticism and think about it. Ask God if there's any validity to what they're saying. But whatever you do, be sure that you don't look at the person who gave the criticism and then start criticizing them. Like, well, who are they to tell me what I'm supposed to do? I mean, look at their life. Because watch this, church. If you're waiting for the perfect person to come along and to give you advice or good correction, you're going to be waiting your whole life. A.W. Tozer said it best when he said, keep your heart open to the correction of the Lord and be willing to receive it regardless of who holds the whip. Amen. And then third, determine to allow God to help you to make changes to the areas that he shows has validity. And you say, now Chris, what do you mean determined to allow God? Well, you see, God will only help you if you want the help. So here's something you gotta understand about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman. And he's only gonna come where he is wanted, where he is welcomed, and where he is invited. But these are three things that we're to do when we're given advice or criticism. But I also want to leave you with three things that we should say to the person that's given us the criticism. Because how we respond matters. I said it matters. So you can write these down if you want, but there are three simple steps to take when someone offers you advice or, or criticism, regardless of whether they're right or wrong, Okay. And the first step is this, is to say to them, I appreciate what you're telling me. I appreciate what you're telling me. And guys, the reason we do that is because you don't realize what it may have taken for this person to come and to bring this to you. I mean, like, I'm a person who, I don't mind confrontation, it doesn't bother me. I just, I'm a people person, I'm a whatever, you know. But when I have to correct someone, man, it's hard for me. And I'm like extreme extrovert. Imagine what it does for them average person to be able to bring something to you. And don't dismiss that. Don't shut that down. If you start shutting that down, I maybe mean, be telling you there's a booger on your face. Next time, they're just going to let it sit there. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm talking about? So whenever someone comes and, and, and they're bringing you something, man, thank them for it. Say, man, thank you. I, I, I appreciate. I had someone say that to me one time, and man, that's where I snagged this point from. I said uh, something, I've only had to say a few corrective things, uh, you know, uh, to other leaders. And I remember one time I said that, and a person looked at me and said, man, thank you, man. I know that wasn't easy for you to come and say that. I really appreciate you doing that. And I was like, whoa. Yeah. That's the first step. The second step is this, is then to say to them, I will pray and think about what you're telling me. Now, don't give them one of those obligation prayers either. Really pray about it. Because you know what I found is that in most every instance, there's a little bit of truth to what someone says. It may not be like fully the truth, but there's a little bit of truth there. If, if nothing else, at least from their perspective, right? And so when someone comes to you and they bring it to you, you're going to thank them, say thank you. And then you're going to pray about it. You're going to say, Lord, show me. I mean, this person sees this in my life. And so if they see it, you know, I, there's got to be some, a little bit of truth there. And, and what is the truth, God, that you want me to see? And then be open to the Holy Spirit to just reveal to you what that is. And then the third step, and this is the third thing that you say to him. I say, listen, if God convicts me about what you're saying, then I'll try my best with his strength to change. 
So you're telling that person, see, this is humility, church. This is what humility looks like. He says, man, thank you. I appreciate you taking the time to come to tell me that. I really do. Thank you. I'll pray about that, and I'll, I'll bring that before the Lord. And, man, hey, if God shows me that, man, that's right, man, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask him to help me to change. How many of you believe that sounds an awful lot like humility? Yeah. Proverbs 1.5 says, let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance. Proverbs 12 and verse 15 says, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. You see, teachability requires humility. It's a willful positioning of the heart to receive from whoever God desires to use to speak into our lives. You know, earlier I read to you Proverbs 21, verse 2, and I want to end on it. It said, every way of a man is right in his own eyes. That being said, might I suggest you seeing through the eyes of another. Invite others to speak into your life. You know what, some of you may even need to apologize for the counsel that has already been spoken and your pride wouldn't allow it. So can we just end our time together just by asking for God's help on all that we talked about today, that he would help us to live right, that his spirit would empower us to be more compassionate. And then the part that he can't do, he can do, but he won't do, and that is to choose to put on humility, to clothe ourselves in humility. Come on, would you stand with me this morning? Lord, we love you. And we thank you, God, for your word. Your word is a, a lamp to our feet. It's a light to our path. God, your commands for our life, they are good. No good thing do you withhold from those who walk uprightly, those who hold your word to truth, Father, and who then choose to walk in it, God. God, our obedience to you, Father, it flows out of our love for you, God. Not that we don't want to become a legalistic, pharisaical, God. We want to obey you, God, because we love you, Lord. And Father, I pray, God, for myself, for this church body, that you would just cause a greater sensitivity to arise in our hearts, to be aware of your presence, oh God, to be aware of your promptings, to be set at the place of reception, of receptivity, God, in regards to your Spirit's promptings, Father, that we would be delicately aware and highly responsive, God, as your Spirit speaks to our lives. So we invite you, Holy Spirit. We invite you, Lord, to soften our hearts. Give us a heart of flesh instead of a heart of stone. It cause us to be more sensitive to your Spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.